we just wanted to make this wonderful announcement about the hashtag she goes green that this is what partnership is all about because someone just literally handed me their phone here because I don't have a very smart phone. So hashtag she goes green, which everyone has been using, is apparently at 384 tweets generating 4,182,000 impressions, reaching an audience of over 3 million in the past 24 hours. So nicely done, ladies. All right. And I think in that time, we have found our presenters. So we'll get this show on the road. Thank you all so much. Um, just from the pieces that I was able to hear, we had some um, inspiring and certainly interesting discussions in the breakout sessions. We apologize that we weren't able to have them go on longer. Um, but I'm sure you all have made uh, connections and will continue the conversations. So I would like to invite our four presenters. I apologize, I don't have names, so I'll have to let you all um, introduce yourself and tell us a couple of sentences uh, about how you come to be here and, uh, and what the issues were that were predominant in your group. Okay. Please. Uh, my name is Akima Price, and I'm an independent consultant. And I'm currently working on an initiative out of the Office of Environmental Education. It was a grant uh, won by the Cornell University, the National Environmental Education Training Program grant which is now called EE Capacity, where we're going out and building capacity. And my role and my specialty is uh, blending environmental education outcomes with quality of life issues in stressed communities. So how to make information relevant and sustainable and you know, to make it really move and do something. Um, and so in my group, the two walkaways were uh, inclusive, engaged leadership and healthy child and family um, through collaboration and environmental education, which is good for me to hear because environmental education is my life. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lillian Molina. I am the Environmental Justice Director at the Energy Action Coalition, also known as the hub of the youth climate movement. We put on a conference called Power Shift that many of you might have come to. We know that um, we partnered with the EPA. And myself, I came from Chicago, an environmental justice community. Great news, we just had um, two coal-fired power plants announce that they will be shutting down. Yeah. So thanks for the enforcement um, office wing and, of course, community grassroots organizing. Um, the two main walkaways that um, we have from our group are similar to yours um, that include a comprehensive communication and education strategy around climate and specifically tr trying to ensure that the framework is very broad um, to ensure that it meets the needs of our communities and um, shows the myriad of impacts that it is having on frontline communities from the reproductive justice component to um, the violence to water issues to food justice um, because we know that the goods movement is um, a huge contributor to um, climate change. So overall, um, I would like to say it's a climate justice framework that is comprehensive in leading our um, society to consume less fossil fuels and be more sustainable, which will in turn um, promote public health. Hello, my name is uh, Sarah Mensa. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Portland Trailblazers in Portland, Oregon. Um, you know, I'm here because the Trailblazers facility, the Rose Garden, is the first lead gold facility on a sport and an existing sports facility in our nation. And uh, we led a team to uh, through some very, very treacherous waters in order to uh, to receive that uh, that award, which we're very, very proud of. And that um, that leadership role as Trailblazers has really uh, spurred a conversation after uh, going for gold. We are, thanks to our owner, we established the sports, um, these, uh, the, this uh, Green, Green Sports, sports Alliance, uh, which is, uh, is starting an extremely exciting conversation about the role of sport and the role that sport can play in helping to initiate change in the world. So our group talked a little bit about that. They talked about how can we expand this conversation beyond uh, just environmentalism, and, uh, and what that meant to our group particularly started with looking at kids and particularly the role that kids uh, play in this conversation, that uh, how we're educating our kids, and how the issues of social justice around our kids, what kind of world we want to leave, leave for them, what are, the, what are the things that kids should be able to expect 
relative to being able to be outside and play and do the things that all of us uh, would want for our kids. But it also involved how do you engage uh, communities that are really not easily engaged in this discussion. And that was something uh, that our group really felt was important in order to expand this conversation. Let's not just preach to the choir. There's a lot of discussion that goes on among groups that are extremely excited about this. But we know that there are many groups that need to hear this message, need to get excited about this message, that aren't currently uh, getting that message. And that expansion really includes the boardroom. Uh, so there was lots of discussion about the role that corporations need to play, that corporations cannot and should not be viewed as the enemy relative to this discussion. There are many corporations that are playing major leadership roles, and if we are engaging them and uh, enga engaging them and viewing the corporations as another important entity that makes up our community, that we'll have a better success. The second real issue that our group came up with is this idea that we depoliticize the conversation wherever possible and make this a singular clear message that can apply to anybody with any uh, political persuasion, with any religious persuasion. It is an individual issue and an issue of human social justice that should apply to all. So however we can come up with a singular message, that's what uh, our group felt like. And finally, find the success stories. Uh, there are so many opportunities uh, that we can highlight where successes are occurring. Successes in terms of jobs, uh, it's a false choice, basically, to view this, uh, this, uh, this problem as one of environment versus jobs. So let's find all those stories and let's highlight them. So this wasn't planned, but I work for Andrews Entertainment Group, which actually manages the Rose Garden, and we're a founding member of the Green Sports Alliance. So Sarah and I knew each other that. We didn't know we were attending. We didn't know we'd be sitting next to each other here, which is hilarious. But um, our group, so I'm a global sustainability director, and my responsibility is to help large-scale sports arenas um, live music theaters, as well as concert fest, concerts, festivals, and the sports teams we own identify energy efficiency, waste, and education. So uh, one of the main things, we basically document our environmental footprint, we measure it, we manage it, and then we share our success stories and hopefully leverage our public in sharing that success stories and show them that, hey, environmental stewardship can be possible, cost savings, and fun, because we're an entertainment facility. So. Thanks to the Rose Garden for being one of our leaders and trailblazers for being the reason they are. So the number one thing that even Gina from the EPA mentioned, our group kind of all said was about environmental literacy and empowerment. So you heard that among everyone in all the breakout sessions, which is education and messaging and how do we empower people to take action by translating the science into action items or translating the science into a message that we can depoliticize and hold together. We actually didn't talk about depoliticizing it, but I think everyone in our group would have agreed with that as a value. So um, environmental empowerment and environmental literacy was a huge topic, especially as it relates to many sustainability issues. So there was a huge emphasis on water in our group, biodiversity, environmental stewardship, and it was all translated back to environmental literacy, but also how do we make this stick when our administrations change, when we change, when we move on? Well, let's start a standard of sustainable transparency through reporting. You can it, it trust the people to make informed decisions if they have inf proper information. So we had some great members of our group that are in the sustainable reporting space. And from investment perspective to our perspective as a private corporation that now measures ourselves and shares that um, pub public information. So there are standards already out there, the Global Reporting Initiative, many other standards. And it's about bringing that to the US and making a standard among ourselves in government, in business, in schools. Every sector has a standard that they could be reporting on. It's kind of like that nutrition label. We all need our eco-nutrition label. Cool. Thank you. Let's hear it for our <laughs> presenters. Wait, you can stay there a minute. Oh. Now, is there is there, are there two or three things that folks are sitting there thinking, gee, I really, really wish they had mentioned X. If there is, raise your hand and give us a couple of sentences about your X. I would love the EPA stand up and, and Clearly Institute in Miami, and you did a great job. Thank you. Because we talked a lot, we didn't shut up. But <laughs> <laughs> I think because the EPA is doing so much so well that I put this out, and I think it was well received. We need a public service announcement campaign where individuals are telling the Pittsburgh story. Why is there a part of a bigger picture? 
and what their particular role is. And you have these E3 initiatives that are perfect umbrellas for this message. So you don't have to recreate a brand. I think E3 is an equalizer of the playing field. So I say, have at it. Thank you. In the back? Right, no, you, right, right there. Please stand up and introduce yourself. Two more, back to this side here. Hi, Natalie Roy with Clean Water Network, and uh, we brought this up in our session, and there was some agreement that it was, I mean, it's a big issue, it's hard, a hard issue, overpopulation, has to be part of the conversation. And last one, I saw another hand up, yes. Thank you, and let's give ourselves a hand and again thank our presenters. Now we are going to uh, uh, close this part of our, uh, our morning um, and invite you for refreshments after we hear our uh, next two speakers. Um, I am delighted to have the opportunity to in introduce my friend and colleague, another of our White House women leaders, uh, Ms. Nancy Sutley. Nancy is the chair of the Council on Environmental Quality and serves as an environmental policy, as the environmental policy advisor to the president. She oversees coordination of federal environmental efforts, working closely with the agencies in the development of environmental policies and initiatives. Prior to her appointment, Ms. Sutley was Deputy Mayor for Energy and the Environment in Los Angeles. She served on the California State Water Resources Control Board, also worked for California Governor Gray Davis as the Energy Advisor, and she served as Deputy Secretary for Policy and Intergovernmental Relations in the California EPA. Please welcome Nancy Sutley. A me-sized podium. Yay. <laughs> I knew this crowd would appreciate that, but uh, it's, really, uh, it's really terrific to be here and to add my uh, welcome to, to all of you to the White House. And thank you for taking your time today to come here and come uh, be, be a part of this. And I, I think I might have the, uh, the toughest job today uh, following the great presentations uh, that were just made, it gave me a lot of things to think about. But it's, uh, it's really terrific to have you all here and uh, great um, to see this incredible group of women committed to a, a healthy and prosperous future uh, for all of your communities, all of our communities, and for our country and for our planet. I think, you know, I don't have to tell this group that women really have an incredible wealth of opportunity to shape the health of our society in the workplace and at home, uh, whether it's in industries uh, like clean energy and manufacturing or through uh, leadership in corporate sustainability or even or, uh, all of the efforts uh, going on in communities, women are clearly making an impact on our environmental health uh, every day. And of course, women play a powerful role in families and especially as we are often strong and vocal advocates for our family's health. And, we, and we know that having clean air and clean water and clean places to, to work, to live and to play affect 
our health and the health of our children and our communities. And I think we all have the ability to catalyze uh, great change and to make great progress together, and many of you that do that every day. I think it's important to remember that it was people uh, coming together that led to the movement that resulted in the environmental and health progress that we see in our country today. And more than 40 years ago, when fires broke out on the open waters of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio and a blowout of offshore oil wells off the coast of California fell the Santa Barbara coast, Americans united to make protecting the health of our environment and our communities a priority. And as we've witnessed throughout our history, this great challenge spurred great action. And out of those events and others like it across the country, we saw the first Earth Day and the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the passage of the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts, and the landmark National Environmental Policy Act that, among other things, created the Council on Environmental Quality. And these efforts were wide and deep across American society, and they were bipartisan. And as a result of that, those efforts and the efforts throughout the years, our air is cleaner, our water is safer, and our communities are healthier. But of course, we have a lot more work to do to clean up pollution in our air and our water, to protect our outdoor spaces, to build the clean energy industries and technologies that will keep us healthy and competitive in the 21st century. And none of this would have happened uh, without, without you and without women like you throughout the decades. Uh, families and communities who care deeply about the environment, especially as they experience it. And it, we're just talking about trailblazers. And you can think about trail, women trailblazers in the environmental movement of Rachel Carson and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And then women like the mothers of East Los Angeles who came together to fight a prison in their neighborhood and fight an incinerator and power plants that were poisoning, would poison their neighborhoods. So as a woman working daily in environmental and energy issues, it's incredibly uh, important to have discussions like we're having today. And I have uh, enjoyed over my career the privilege of working on energy and environmental matters at all levels of government, at, at uh, federal government, state and local government, and the privilege to work with a lot of really amazing uh, community leaders. And over the years, I, I've worked with many outstanding women who are deeply committed to the environment. And uh, my colleagues from the EPA, uh, all arrayed here in, uh, in the front row, uh, are testament uh, to the in incredible uh, talent and skills uh, that women bring in, in the federal uh, environmental space. Uh, I, I can speak for uh, my friend Lisa Jackson uh, and, and I, we both have been in this business uh, long enough uh, to see how uh, talent, talented women uh, have risen to leadership uh, in this field. And I think um, I'm, I'm certainly grateful for that. And the president is clearly uh, committed to elevating women to uh, leadership positions, as, as you can see from uh, our esteemed front row here. Uh, and I, I'm also uh, honored to participate on the President's Council of Women and Girls with talented women uh, from across the administration. And I think the most remarkable thing, and this is not just what's going on inside the Obama administration, but this is what's going on uh, in our country, um, that, that uh, environment is not just the responsibility of the agencies whose primary missions are the environment, but that across the federal government, across our federal agencies, uh, and across our society, uh, people are tackling uh, environmental issues as part of the core work that they do. And one area I, I wanted to spend a minute on is environmental justice. And it, that's, this is an issue that uh, especially affects women in low-income uh, and minority communities. And this is not an issue that uh, we invented, uh, that the government thought up, that this is something uh, we work on because we thought about it, um, but it really came from the communities and communities demanding a voice 
uh, in decisions that affect, the, that affect them. A few weeks ago, federal agencies uh, led by CEQ and EPA released environmental justice strategies outlining uh, how they are working uh, with all of uh, the advocates across the country to protect communities that are overburdened by pollution, a burden that threatens not just the health but the economic well-being of these communities. And these strategies, I think, represent a significant step forward in uh, the Obama administration's commitment to integrating environmental justice into federal decision making and programs in a whole variety of areas, in transportation and labor and health services and housing and others. In that, and these strategies also build on the progress that we've made in these incredibly important issues during this administration, including new, new standards that double fuel economy of our cars and trucks, uh, saving more than 12 billion barrels of oil and slashing 6 billion tons of greenhouse gases by 2025, and the health benefits uh, of reducing air pollution from cars. A historic $90 billion in uh, investments in clean energy through the Recovery Act, uh, new clean air protections that will protect children's health and create new jobs, including the first ever uh, national standards for mercury and toxic pollution from power plants and a commitment by the federal government itself to reduce its pollution, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 28 percent by 2020. In addition to uh, this administration's progress on environmental issues, we've taken actions to support and encourage and protect women and girls by, by supporting women-owned businesses, uh, to creating initiatives that provide greater workplace, workplace flexibility for women, it, the Obama administration has made the needs of women and girls uh, one of its top priorities. There's a lot of progress, but we still have uh, real challenges and a lot of important work to, together. So I commend you for taking these environmental challenges head on and, and showing the kind of leadership uh, that makes this country great. And you don't have to be an engineer or a scientist, although it helps, but you just have to care and get involved. and and uh, seek out that information. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your support. Thank you for all your work. And because I think taken together and the energy in this room, uh, I feel confident that we're building a healthier and more prosperous country and a healthier future uh, for all Americans. So uh, thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure uh, to reintroduce uh, to all of you, uh, my friend and my colleague, the Administrator of the EPA, Lisa Jackson. Okay, so how was it? Let's see? There's just something about this place and this building and this moment in time and all of you. So again, thank you very, very much for being here. I was literally, I kid you not, I'm walking in and three people stopped me and said, wow, wow, what a group you have in there. They're um, working so hard and you can feel the energy in the room and it's already leaving because I guess many of you have already started your blogs and folks online are watching as well. So thank you. Um, as you all know, we are a force, and if you get in our way, well, we feel sorry for you. Um, I, it's my job to close things out, so I'll be very, very brief. Um, I know that this will not be the last time we're talking. You're welcome anytime at EPA, and we can set that up, but we thought it was so special to have us all do this in the White House, um, especially um, uh, now. So let me thank those who did this. That's uh, not only my leadership team at the EPA, who I know uh, were on a couple of panels, and you got a chance to see how fortunate I am to be surrounded by these amazing leaders who just happen to be women, um, <laughs> but also the folks who are not going to take credit, but all the folks who work so hard to pull this together. So thank you very much. Please join me in giving them <laughs> Thank you.
and of course to the folks from the administration in the White House. I think Haley uh, uh, out there, she is in the back. Thank you again for making this possible. I think you have a lot of grateful folks uh, who will have a chance to thank you uh, personally. Uh, now I know you're going to go out. When I started, I said that the purpose of preaching to the choir is so that you can sing. You're starting to sing. I cannot wait to hear the groundswell of voices. I know and hope that you've been inspired not only to protect human health and the environment in your own way, the way you do it, but also to go out and plug and talk about why that's important and that you, we've given you some information that you can use as well as each other, the networking that comes from spending a little bit of time together. Um, there is a commitment card in your packet. It looks like this. Um, it asks you to, oh, you said you knew that already? Um, White House Women in the Environment Summit commitment card. Take a moment, if you will, um, to jot down one thing you're committed to, one issue that uh, you want to make sure you're going to be working on, so you want us to know that as well. You might want to jot your name and contact info. We have your contact, but if it's leg le legible, your name and organization. And um, Stephanie and Drew, Stephanie likely will be carry, uh, mostly collecting those. Uh, people will be bugging you for them. You don't have to turn it in if you prefer to put your commitment down. Writing is always good, though, because it actualizes your commitment. But if you want to keep it, that's fine, too. But we'd be happy to have them um, and use them as a point where we can interact with you guys in another way. Um, I am about to do an online Twitter conversation for those who've been watching us online. So thanks to the folks who've been online watching us. Uh, you've already started the energy. We're going to keep that going uh, online. And uh, the hashtag is um, she goes green. She goes green. So um, the rest of you, though, who are here in person are going to get a little bit of a treat, which is to spend a little time together with each other. I'll hopefully be joining you when we're finished with the uh, um, Twitter conversation. And that's going to be directly across the hall. So you walk out this door and sort of you walk down a long black and white tiled hallway, and we have a reception uh, in that room. You deserve it. You deserve a minute to. Uh, relax after sitting and working so hard all day, but you also deserve a chance to get to know at least one or two people you haven't gotten to know before. I would also be remiss if I didn't say that this crowd looking out and seeing the diversity of the women in this audience and the strength that that means warms my heart. We we said we would build and expand on the conversation on environment and bring new voices uh, to the movement, but also new decision makers to the table. We'll keep uh, up our end of the bargain, but thank you, thank you, thank you for being thank here you. today. All right, have fun. Thank you.